George Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. A barely continent, barely sentient 80-year-old man has declared he's going to shuffle for a second term as President of the United States of America. He looked like a taxidermist had stuffed him. The formaldehyde could be smelt off the screen. Yes, Joe Biden is off and shuffling for a second term. And Tucker Carlson, who looks fragrant by comparison, handsome, eloquent, and paid $1.6 million a month to cast his spell over an increasingly large part of the American television audience, has been sacked by the even older Rupert Murdoch. He makes Joe Biden look like a young thing. What got Tucker Carlson sacked? Was it one damn thing or was it one damn thing after another? And China's peace plan for the Ukraine took an important step forward with the appointment of a Chinese plenipotentiary who will shuttle between the parties and seek to find a ceasefire and a politically agreed plan to end the war in the Ukraine. Anyone who wasn't a bloodthirsty warmonger would have welcomed this with open arms. That's why NATO and the Pentagon did not welcome it with open arms. Will it go anywhere? Well, Xi Jinping would scarcely be doing this if he didn't think it had a fighting chance of success. And last night, him and Zelensky had a long, deep and meaningful telephone call. That all sounds like good news to me. How about you and Rashid Sanuk, the British Prime Minister, went all Kim Jong-il. He was running down Whitehall. Well, he was in a gas guzzler, even though it was Earth Day. But alongside him, foot police and bicycle police in their hundreds were escorting him all the way to the Houses of Parliament. If it was a stunt, it backfired badly as ridicule throughout the land and the cry, this is just not British. But this is the mother of all talk shows, so fasten your seatbelt. It's going to be a bumpy night. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. Galloway, the mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom, and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. I've just learned, actually, in the last few minutes from my grandson, Sean, that it was Earth Day, and that that might have been the putative reason for the pantomime which took place. All it needed was a pantomime horse, actually, at the front of it, in Whitehall this week. Rashid Sanuk, who is elected by nobody at all, not even the members of the Conservative Party in Parliament, came over all presidential. They picked the leanest and meanest of London's bobbies to run down the road. It looked more like Dumpling Day than Earth Day to me. And then instead of motorcyclists, we had this parade of cops on push bikes accompanying the gas guzzler that contained Rashid Sanuk, the British Prime Minister. The last time I saw something like that, it was uh, Kim Jong-il, the, no, Kim Jong-un, the North Korean leader, uh, who was widely ridiculed for having a gigantic bomb-proof Mercedes alongside which ran his security detail. And here we are, the British are copying the North Koreans. We were not supposed to laugh at our leader doing it. Only North Korean leaders should be laughed at for such things. 
If it was for Earth Day, it went over my head or under my feet. I had no idea that that was its purpose, and its purpose was never stated. All it did was make Rashid Sanuk look even more small, which is quite an achievement considering he is pretty much the invisible man in British politics. Invisible, of course, in European politics, in NATO politics, invisible in international politics. It's scarcely worthwhile having him there at all. And there's still talk of Boris Johnson making a comeback. Although Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, is now beginning to slip in the polls, so who knows, a second term for Rashid Sanouk might not be ruled out. You can't rule out a second term for the incontinent, the feeble, uh, the scarcely cognizant President of the United States of America. I very much hope that the famous deep state in the US has replaced the football at the bottom of his bed because thinking he's pressing for another cup of cocoa, he might just press the nuclear button and we might all be history, although there'll be no one left to record that history. That this man is in charge of still the most powerful country in the world, whose defense spending dwarfs that of the next 16 countries in total combined. This man, who presides over 800 foreign military bases, many of them bristling with the aforementioned nuclear weapons, this man, who is in charge of a flight of more than 3,500 thermonuclear weapons, cannot tie his shoelaces, cannot make the bathroom in time, even in august company, like His Holiness the Pope in the Vatican. Joe Biden literally soiled himself in front of the, the impact of the Roman Catholic Church. Joe Biden isn't fit to be sent out for a loaf. But not only is he the President of the United States, he's decided he's running again for another term. And the Democratic Party have promptly endorsed him and banned any presidential debates against any candidate who might exercise their democratic right to stand against him. Only one so far has done so, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And when you think about it, it's an act of mercy not to put Joe Biden on a stage with RFK Jr., who even though he likes him and has known him for all of his life, would knock him out flat. It would not since Rocky Marciano fought the hapless bunch of horizontal chumps that used to be put up against them, would a mismatch like it have ever been seen? So they've decided not to have any presidential debates. But not only that, Bernie Sanders, on the day that Biden announced, he was running again with a record of oppression of workers in the United States, railway workers banned from striking, a record of inflation that is bleeding white, the working people of America, a record as long as your arm of imprisoning a whole nation of black people in the United States, a record of being a foghorn for war like the Iraq war throughout his 51 years in the Senate, a record of having dragged us all onto the brink of World War III, despite all of that, within an hour or two of Biden's announcement, if you can call it that, Bernie Sanders gave him his endorsement. Well, in a way, if the Americans are stupid enough to re-elect Joe Biden, good luck to them. It's their business. But my question to Europe, to Australia, to the rest of the world of vassals over which Joe Biden rules, is why are you following to the edge of a cliff 
a man, why are you taking orders from an emperor so decrepit that he cannot be let out alone, cannot find his way off a stage, cannot read an auto cue, cannot control his own bowels? Have you no self-respect in the chanceries of Europe, in Westminster and Whitehall, down in Canberra? Do you not care about the optics of all of this? You who told us that Donald Trump would put us into World War III are now following blindly this decrepit old man as he drags us closer than we have ever been before, closer than the Cuban Missile Crisis to a world war with nuclear weapons a thousand times more powerful and deadly than the weapons that we were threatened with back in those days of the early 1960s in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Tucker Carlson got the bag. I wonder, we're asking in a poll what it was that got Fox News' highest rating commentator taken off the air. It couldn't have been the cost of 1.6 million salary a month. I mean, Tucker's good, but he should be good. He has a whole army of people preparing his shows and helping to write his scripts. He reads the scripts from an auto cue and he gets $1.6 million a month for doing so. He should be good, but he is good, better than all the rest. And it can't be that he was too expensive a ticket because Rupert Murdoch's son was in the middle of negotiating with him an extension of his contract until 2029. That's how keen Fox were just a week or two ago to keep Tucker Carlson on board, and now they have sacked him. Now, I kind of take the view of Lionel, my good friend in New York, that just like John Stewart, remember him, who left primetime American television to go and run a petting zoo in New Jersey or somewhere like it, John Stewart was very quickly forgotten. There's a danger if Tucker Carlson doesn't strike now while the iron is hot that he will go the same way, forgotten in just the same way. But somehow, I don't think Tucker Carlson is going to go quietly. There's talk today in the financial papers that the Murdochs have trussed him up, gagged him until the end of his contract, which would take him beyond the presidential election. Is Tucker really going to sit out the next presidential election, say nothing about it, only to get his $1.6 million a month? Because if he is, if I was Donald Trump, I'd find some other billionaire to pay him the $1.6 million a month and get him out there on the stump talking and using his name and face recognition in support of a Trump presidency. Maybe that will happen. Maybe Tucker will tell the Murdochs to stick their money for the rest of the contract and make even more money, either on his own, like I'm doing here, or on some other channel, some other platform. We'll have to wait and see. But the big news of the day, bigger than any other news could possibly be, is the announcement from China and from Kiev that President Xi Jinping and President Zelensky <coughs> excuse me, had a long telephone call conversation last evening, that China has appointed uh, the head of their Eurasian desk in the foreign ministry as a special envoy for China to visit Kiev and to begin a shuttle of diplomacy which is long overdue and which has been precluded by the veto, by the black bowling of exactly that by the United States government in Washington, who you'll recall, the last time there was any possibility of peace brokered by Turkey, they sent Boris Johnson to Kiev to warn Zelensky that he would not be permitted to agree to a ceasefire and a political solution to a conflict which has cost the lives 
of hundreds of thousands of people, the treasure of both countries and the wrecked economies of all the sanctioning countries that followed Joe Biden in his bid to lift a huge rock only to drop it on our own feet. Xi Jinping doesn't go in for stunts. He's not a PR type of guy. If he's made this call, he must have known that the call would be received well. If he has appointed this envoy, he must know that the envoy stands at least a fighting chance of being able to broker a peace deal. What would a peace deal look like? Well, I don't speak for Russia. I have no idea of Russia's mind in this affair. I haven't even spoken to a Russian about it. Not any Russian at all, of any kind. Not even Igor that serves me up my borscht in my local Russian restaurant. I have no idea if this is Russia's point of view. But if I was running Russia, here are the minimum terms for an end to the war that I would accept. First of all, self-determination for the Russian-speaking people of Eastern Ukraine. This is a must. Russia has not gone this far, done all this, suffered the ostracism and sanction of the entire so-called Western world in order to hand back its compatriots, its co-religionists, its fellow Russian citizens, now in many cases, to the tender mercy of an ultra-nationalist government in Kiev tinged with Nazi support. If not at the fringes, then perhaps a little bit in closer than just the fringes. They will not do that. They will never accept it. The Russian people would never accept it either. The banning, not just of Ukraine joining NATO, but of NATO joining Ukraine. All kinds of people have been fixated on the issue of whether or not Ukraine can join NATO. But NATO joined Ukraine, according to Stoltenberg, as long ago as 2014. And many would argue, I among them, that NATO has been in Ukraine almost from the day that the Ukrainian state was formed. So a formula which ensures that Ukraine doesn't join NATO and NATO is nowhere near Ukraine, would it seem to me be an obvious red line for Moscow in exchange for stopping the advance of the Russian forces in eastern Ukraine. A third would be an explanation for and full transparency over the dozens of bio labs that the United States Department of Defense set up all over Ukraine. If I were the Russians, I would want full transparency over that. And lastly, I would want the lifting of all the sanctions imposed on Russia as a result of the special military operation which began in February of 2022. The sanctions have not affected Russia in the way that they intended. But they've affected the countries that imposed them very severely indeed. And as I'm not a Russian and don't speak for Russia, and I'm a European and a British citizen, I want our countries to escape from that self-inflicted wound that we imposed upon ourselves when we embarked on this road of sanctions. So an end to sanctions, an end to the tango between Kiev and NATO and NATO and Kiev, self-determination for the Russian-speaking people of eastern and southern Ukraine, and lastly, a recognition that the Crimean Peninsula, which was a part of Russia for thousands of years, which voted overwhelming to rejoin Russia, will be recognized internationally as a part of Russia. The Russian fleet requires Crimea. 
They will never give it up. The people of Crimea would never agree to it being given up. Lastly, I pose a simple question. It's a simple question to which there is literally no answer. No answer possible. Today, Ursula von der Leyen, at the dispatch box, made a fulsome celebration, she said, of the 75 years of the existence of the State of Israel. A state which, in defiance of all international law, continues illegally to occupy huge tracts of Palestinian land and has illegally annexed East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights and openly threatens to annex the Jordan Valley. How is it possible for the EU to celebrate Israel in the light of this brazen illegality? Now over decades, decades, over half a century, how is that possible? Yet the EU cannot accept that the people of Crimea can return to Russia and the current state of affairs being described as a Russian occupation of Crimea. And secondly, equally impossible to answer, how is it possible for the United States of America to demand recognition of the illegal unilateral secession of Kosovo from Serbia whilst denying the same right to the people of Crimea. How can that logically, as a matter of simple logic, how can that be squared? How is it possible? You can invent a state called Kosovo, torn from its own country, Serbia, where a substantial Serbian minority are now persecuted religiously, nationally, ethnically persecuted under the guns of NATO and yet you're ready to risk World War III over Kupiansk. I keep telling you to fasten your seatbelts. This is going to be a bumpy night because it is the mother of all talk shows. Mr. President, we got a report of a 50-foot woman marauding through Washington, sir. Thank you, Captain. But I'm looking for a shorter woman, one who likes to take long strolls in the park and yell at minorities. She's not looking for a date. She's terrorizing the city. Is there a difference? <laughs> a little levity. Call in the military. <clears throat> we are the military, sir. Boy, we got here fast. We better do something, right? Shall I scramble the jets, Mr. President? No thanks, I'll just take a muffin and some coffee. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, I told you we're running a poll. 10,000 people have voted in it already, and the show has just begun. What issue got Fox News Tucker Carlson sacked? A, COVID, B, RFK Jr., C, the Ukraine. It's running on my Twitter, on this YouTube, if you're watching live now on YouTube, on my Telegram channel, t.me forward slash George Galloway, and on the YouTube community poll where 7,000 people have already voted. And it's uh, quite an interesting result so far. 23% say it was over COVID. 22% uh, say it was over RFK Jr. And 55% say it was over Ukraine. On YouTube, it's 17, 27, and 56. On Telegram, 19, 27, and 54. And on the YouTube community poll, it's 13, 
22 and 65. Now, if you want to comment on what I've said or not said, uh, and you're in the US or Canada, here are the numbers. And remember, it's toll free. It's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. That's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. If you're in the UK or Ireland, it's o eight o eight one nine six double five double two. Free of charge. Remember o eight o eight one nine six double five double two. And there's also a, a number for the rest of the world, which I think is coming up on the screen. But our first guest is waiting, and I don't want to keep him standing there because he is a delight, one of the most popular of the guests we've had on the show. He is Nico House, political commentator and founder of the MCSC Network. Maybe he'll tell us what that network is. Nico, welcome back to the mother of all talk shows. First of all, tell us, what is the MCSC Network? So MCSC actually just stands for Mikasa and Sukasa because my last name is House. And I, whenever I started the, my show, uh, Mikasa and Sukasa, the podcast, it was to make it so, so that the average person could understand, you know, the complexities of politics uh, in the most simplistic way possible, almost like you're talking to a family member at a, at a dinner table about what happened that day in your life. And that was the goal. And so far, I think we've done a pretty good job achieving it. You know, some people like to overcomplicate politics, but I think you and I know things are a lot simpler uh, than they, than, than, they than the world or the mainstream media make them out to be. They are. Uh, and here's one simple uh, truth, because Joe Biden told us it during the last election campaign. If you are not voting Joe Biden, you ain't black. Uh, that didn't go <laughs> down all that well. Uh, <laughs> He really did say that. Uh, he, uh, he, he shuffled himself back onto uh, the front foot and announced that he's running again. How has that gone down amongst the American public? Um, well, the majority of Democrats actually don't want him to run again. So obviously it's not going that well. But I think there's a few frustrating aspects that you have to address. One, the fact that Bernie Sanders has already came out and endorsed him. That's problematic. Um, not that I was expecting Bernie to run against him, but he's not even listening or hearing out other candidates, which means that once again, despite labeling himself as an independent, he's going to march lockstep with the, the Democratic Party, uh, not giving himself any separation, and once again, making you question if he ever really truly considered himself an independent. Two, the fact that they have decided to completely and totally ban debates for the primary. Uh, which seems like now that will make, make the Republican and the Democratic Party alike and that they will not be holding primary debates. And apparently they're trying to even stop general election debates. So this could be the first election where we have literally zero debates uh, for the entire election, which once again is problematic because the Democrats' own party, pre the president's own party, doesn't actually seem to believe that he's fit to be president, yet they don't want to hear other voices. And then three, uh, I just find it really crazy to, to think that people believe that the U.S. Uh, is a democracy when a, a guy who literally can't remember what he had for breakfast uh, is probably going to win president again and it's not really a question in anybody's mind whether or not that's going to be the case. No, no matter how impressive RFK or Marianne Williamson might consider themselves to be or their voters might consider themselves to be, at the end of the day, Dominion, who by the way owns 7 percent of Fox News, um, is still in charge of the election. And we have not really substantively addressed what we saw take place where we just saw the most technically the most popular presidential incumbent incumbent in history who increased his voter base amongst all demographics except for white men get beat by a guy who literally had to put in his teeth that morning before uh, giving his his uh, his winning speech. So, like, it's it's a problem. I feel like it's a problem uh, across the board that. We're basically in a satire, except for their actual lives and international policies on the line, and we're not really taking this matter seriously enough. It is a satire. That is a brilliant line. Uh, and, but if it was a satire, you would turn away from it, because there's only so long you can laugh at a guy <laughs> in the state that Joe Biden is in. Uh, in the end, you would turn away and say, this is elder abuse, what kind of a family has this man got that is putting him up uh, to suffer the ridicule 
not just of Americans, but the whole world. I've got to tell you, Nico, the, these videos of uh, poor old Joe wandering around, lost, even in his own garden, uh, uh, unable to uh, know where to stand, even when there's a big giant X where he's supposed to stand, reading <laughs> out the stage instructions. Uh, when, you know, he gets to the end of the line and it says, turn the page. He reads out, turn the page. Uh, he reads out, uh, stop here. Uh, yeah. but this, this is satire, To be fair, though, Kamala isn't that much is, different, right? It is, it I don't is, know if it's uh, our speech is It is cruel, right, Nico? It, it is cruel, but to be fair, Kamala doesn't seem to be all that much different when it comes to the mental gates. I don't know if you saw her recent speech where she was... I actually don't even know what she was talking about. She's like, it's important in this moment that we really think about this moment and we contextualize the moment that we're in with contextualization. I'm like, hold on. I know that we don't want Biden to be president because we believe that his age is causing some mental deterioration, but Kamala is like 50 years younger than this man. What is going on? It's, it's almost like they're sharing the same brain, unfortunately, which once again doesn't bode well for the American people. But I think that you would agree, being an international citizen yourself, this doesn't bode well for the world. We're on, we are on the cusp of World War III. The, the U.S. government has made that pretty clear, that that is their goal. And with BRICS aligning in the way that they are, making the economic moves internationally, making the partnerships internationally, uh, I don't see, like, we, we know that Biden is a puppet, and we know who the puppet masters are. And we know that when circumstances align, when they believe that there is legitimate, uh, a legitimate competition for them economically around the world, they just go straight to war war. This is, history has proven this already. And we are on the cusp of that right now, and Biden is a puppet who will, will not push back on that. That's what we need to be really talking about more. Um, the gates are funny, but like the gates, in my in my opinion, are just it just just displays how much control he's really he really doesn't have over the situation, which means we don't have control over the situation, and we know what the powers that be do uh, whenever they don't whenever they feel like they're not in control economically of the international community, and right now they don't have control. I'm glad you said that about Kamala Harris. Uh, um... I call her laughing gas. Uh, she, she doesn't seem to know when to laugh and when to stop laughing. Uh, she laughs at the most inappropriate things, times, and can't stop laughing. Uh, and I'm not sure, you know, you're too young to know, but Richard Nixon had a vice president called Spiro Agnew, who was such a kook that Nixon used to say, no one will ever shoot me with this guy next in line. And Joe Biden's oh, more or less in the same situation, uh, that uh, if you don't want me, you're going to get her. Uh, as, how did the Democratic Party get to this? How do you go from, from Jack Kennedy to Joe Biden and Kamala Harris? What changed in well, the Democratic Party? I, I would say that the Democratic Party is the only party that you can literally fail upwards. In fact, I would say it's almost a prerequisite to be a abysmal failure in what you do uh, in order to become successful in the party. Whether you're talking about Hillary Clinton, who really had no political experience whatsoever, and then they gave her the second most powerful position in the world. When I say political experience, I mean like actually running the show. They they like she didn't have any experience, um, and then she was Secretary of State. And then they were like, actually, she's the most qualified person ever. I was like, I don't really, I think our definitions of qualified have drastically changed over the years. And then you have Joe Biden who had to drop out of a, 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 at least a couple of races for plagiarizing speeches because he couldn't write his own. And then for, you know, being a segregationist. And I mean, the dude, he's only made horrible bills that have, have turned this country inside out, whether you want to talk about the 94 crime bill or the telecommunications act that nobody talks about in 1996. I mean, the guy has been horrible. He has been unpopular. And that was part of the reason they put him beside Obama because they knew he would never really challenge Obama's popularity in that regard. And so Obama will keep the authority while Biden could quote unquote help guide foreign policy, which really just means tell Obama what the establishment wants. And even though he's been an abysmal failure, the man ends up, obviously, as president, and they say that he's the one with the experience. And I'm like, I feel like when y'all say experience, I mean, that means like a person is stupid enough to be controlled, and therefore, you want him to be president, right? Because you don't have to, like, think about Kamala. That Kamala literally was so unpopular that she 
by the end of the week after Tulsa destroyed her campaign, she went from having like 93% of the black vote to 2% of the black vote, couldn't even make it to the primary to get a single vote. So they were like, you know what, the, we got to pair her with Biden be, to make him more popular. Like, no, I think we just established she isn't popular at all. Well, like, that's what we actually mean, though. We mean she isn't popular, and therefore we should pair them together because they need us to maintain the air of popularity. They need us to be taken seriously, and that is how we will keep them in line because their legacies matter more to them more to them than anything. And they will try to maintain their legacy by doing what we say. How do you think uh, Kennedy has done in the opening week or so of his uh, campaign? It looks pretty impressive to me. He looks impressive. Um, I, I enjoyed his interview on Tucker Carlson. I, 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 I strongly agree with a lot of his takes uh, on, on the COVID situation um, you know, prior to this. Uh, I, I appreciate his take on Ukraine and Russia as well. I do find, feel like it was, it's a little weird that he called Joe Biden his friend when addressing the whole situation about not having debates. And the reason I say that, I know people were saying, well, you got to play this game. And the, Listen, guys, I don't know if you, you, you've noticed, <laughs> World War III is about to start. <laughs> we don't need anybody pretending to be friends with Joe Biden or anybody in the establishment. If there was ever a time to go scorch Earth, it's now. Because if you don't, the earth might literally be scorched in a couple of years. That's how I feel about that situation. I understand the, the, the goal, but we saw the whole my good friend Joe Biden with Bernie Sanders. And how did that turn out? We need somebody to show that they are willing to fight. The one advantage that Trump could always use uh, was the fact he was willing to go at the establishment Republicans in a way that independents like uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, or even I would make the argument, Tulsi Gabbard didn't even go at Joe Biden. They didn't go at the legacy guys like they like like Trump went after the legacy Republicans, and Trump won. And yet we still have not gotten that leftist champion, um, like like or at least populist leftist champion, like the right got their populist conservative champion. And I would make the arguments because well they they're not willing to go scorch earth. And this 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 uh this this politeness that we are seeing. Uh, it, it isn't going to bode well because now you're stuck in that. And the moment that you try to deviate that from that, from that even a little bit, everyone starts attacking you like as this mean person, you know, this toxic person. Whereas if you just come out with guns blazing, I mean, because they've had no problem doing that with. What well, have you got Jr. to lose? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, uh, exactly. Trump had nothing to lose, and and it worked. Now you mentioned you have to Tucker play like Carlson. That we're the, about to lose everything. Do yeah, we're you about do. To lose everything. You, you mentioned Tucker Carlson. Uh, a few things came as a surprise to me about that story. The first was his $1.6 million a month wages. Uh, uh, he's good, but uh, that's a lot of money to read an auto to. <laughs> that's a lot of uh, money. Um, <laughs> uh, but the second was that Fox were ready to ditch a guy whose ratings are 10 times the ratings of, uh, of any of the centrist uh, commentators, the Rachel Maddows, the CNN, and all the rest. What's that all about, do you think? First of all, I just want to say it's crazy that Tucker Carlson never had to learn a jump shot, but he's out here getting NBA money. That's wild. Um, that's impressive, impressive in and of itself. Um, I would also like to say that I don't find it coincidental that he has RFK on, obviously, and we know where he stands on, on vaccines. He has on, uh, he, he had this conversation, and he even kind of, kind of sarcastically included Fox News in this conversation, but he had this conversation about how the networks, uh, on be, at the behest of their advertisers, push these vaccines on people. Uh, what, they didn't, what people don't seem to realize, though, is that uh, Pfizer is 15% of... of of, uh, no, excuse me, Dominion 15% of his advertisement, which is crazy because it's a mean lawsuit just happened and the settlement just happened and he's fired. But also, Pfizer is one of the top advertisers for Fox News and people don't know it. <laughs> so mm. It, mm. it literally could be all of the above. It's the fact that, and the fact that Rupert Murdoch uh, actually is all in for DeSantis. And even though Tucker hasn't been 100% Trump, he's been willing to call out when some of the inequ uh, he's been willing to call some of the inequities that Trump and uh, Bernie Sanders and a Tulsi Gabbard and, can and RFK obviously candidates like that have faced. 
And so if you're if if the tables are being uh, tipped in the favor of Ron DeSantis over Trump in some type of unfair way, obviously Tucker seems like the type of person that will call that out. Tucker has is is, is seemingly paid the paying the price of being on the right side when it comes to the, the grander issues. I rarely agree with Tucker Carlson when it comes to social justice issues. I don't really agree with him when it comes to the issue of China. But really outside of those issues, when it comes to the, the big league politics, when it comes to calling out the establishment, when it comes to the Russia-Ukraine war, when it comes to the issue on vaccines and mandates, um, in the way that candidates on both sides of the fence, whether it be in the Democratic Party or Republican Party, have been treated by the establishment, Tucker has been right. And it seems like he's just paying the price for being on the right side of history uh, more often than not over the last two or three years. Nico House, as always, a pleasure to talk to you on the mother of all talk shows. Thank you for joining us. What issue got Fox News? Tucker Carlson sacked is what we're asking on the poll, on Twitter, on YouTube, on the Telegram channel, t.me forward slash George Galloway on the YouTube community poll. Let's take a quick break and then it's your calls. Gosh darn, how do you get this thing to work? Ah, uh, is it that one? Is it, is it this one here? Gosh. Was this thing built in America? Jeez. Kamala, would you get in here? I can't get the, uh, gosh darn wireless to work. <laughs> you know I can't answer questions, Joe, when I'm laughing. Uh, I'm trying uh, to, uh, listen to that Scottish guy on the wireless. The, uh... The, the Galloway fella. Oh, Joe, you're so funny. <laughs> <laughs> I've been pressing this red button on and off and on and off. Heck, I can't get it to work. Uh, hello, Biden residence. Mr. President, be advised we have executed the airstrike on Syria. <laughs> That's just great. Uh, how long until it gets delivered? I'm starving. Let's take a call. Go ahead, Kenny. Hi, George. Yeah, I just want to talk about the trans issue that you were speaking about earlier. Yeah, I've got go a book in front of me by uh, Douglas Murray, and he's got a paragraph here. So I'd just like to redo it if that's okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. I was standing on the corner <laughs> at a quarter. All right, I'll, 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 I'll get him off, get him off. He's a nutter. He's a nutter. In the UK, it's 08. 081-965-522. And in the US, it's plus one, eight four four nine four four double three double four. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Okay, uh, I know it seems like forever that we've had two mother of all talk shows every week and the midweek show is now just as big as the Sunday show. But you'll have noticed that the Wednesday show no longer has a sponsor. If you know anyone who'd like to sponsor us, given the size of our audience, it's a, a good commercial bet for someone to do so. But in the absence of a spot, pardon me, a sponsor on a Wednesday night, the show is obviously in the medium term in some danger. So we need your support. You need to donate if we're going to continue to be able to have two shows uh, per week. Now, the most efficient way of supporting us is through the super chat mechanism on YouTube. It's very, very simple. Even I could do it. You go to the super chat mechanism, you click on a number and send. And you can leave a comment, which I will do everything I can to read out. And they are coming in now. 
and I'm grateful to you all for that. Yusuf Abu Ayash sends 49 US dollars, 49.99 cents. Yusuf, thank you uh, very much indeed. I knew uh, Abu Ayash family in Jerusalem. I wonder if you're from that. I wonder if I knew your father. TC sends 10 US dollars. Thank you, TC. Roar Axdal sends 25 Norwegian crowns as he does every single week. And I'm grateful to him. Mr. Lover, another weekly donor, sends another five pounds. Karim Al Nashi, another weekly donor, sends four pounds ninety-nine. Nasri Akil, another regular donor, sends twenty Canadian dollars. And says, sacking Tucker Carlson shows that the mainstream media is failing and the West is losing its most potent weapon, media. The proliferation of Gigi's moats around the free globe has accelerated that. Thanks, Nasser. Torlo Burke sends 5 euros 99. Thanks, Torlo. Lyle Gentleman sends 5 US dollars and says the US is becoming a fascist state if it is not already one. We need change and peace now. And Oran Kiani sends five pounds. The best day of my life would be the day that Gigi became the British Prime Minister. Thanks for that. Rudolf Grasspointer sends five euros. Tucker got fired for getting too religious. There is a war against religion. Evil versus good lies versus truth. Uh, Emmett is on the line from Manchester, I think in England, and wants to talk about Ukraine. Emmett, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. Yeah, it is Manchester in England. Welcome. I just wanted to ask a question. Um, when it comes to Ukraine, do you think the Ukrainian people have the right to violently resist the, the Russian occupiers? Of course. Anybody who is uh, invaded by uh, a foreign army uh, has the right to resist and undoubtedly will resist. And the Ukrainian uh, armed forces uh, have uh, performed heroics in the defense of their territory. Uh, they have been sent into battle uh, by a rancid uh, political regime. Uh, their cause uh, of that regime is ignoble, uh, but the individual Ukrainian soldier uh, has in the main uh, performed extremely uh, bravely. Uh, but the point is, and I suspect we're not going to agree on this, is that this war should never have started. And it only started back in 2014 because of the violent overthrow of the elected president and the elected parliament, which was then accompanied by a full-scale civil war effort against the people of eastern Ukraine and, and the massacre of civilians, Ukrainian citizens, who spoke Russian and lived in the east of Ukraine, were, were wiped out in their thousands by this new coup regime in Kiev. So it's not about the individual bravery of Ukrainians and their right uh, to resist. It's about what this war started over. And that's what I suspect you and I are not going to agree on. Last word to you, Emmett. Well, that's because you're lying, isn't it? You, you don't actually believe the war started in 2014. You're using that as a retrospective justification for the invasion last year, aren't you? Because you didn't oppose the 2014 um, war, did you? Didn't I? Well, Emmett, uh, for lying. a man that called as me a liar, for a man that for Emmett, for a man that's called me a liar, you're remarkably ill-informed. If you look at my Twitter feed, you will see a tweet from me in 2015 entitled discussing the ukraine war with the voters of bradford so stick that where the sun doesn't shine put it in your pipe and then smoke it it'll suit you lance is in canada let's hear from him go ahead lance 
Uh, your last caller, it's kind of funny because uh, I was watching Redacted and they had a clip from CNN from 2016. And CNN, I guess before they had their marching orders, literally was covering the Ukrainian government's assault on the people of Donbass. And CNN was suggesting exactly. that it used Donbass to be quite regularly. Assault. It used to be quite regularly on the media, Lance. I mean, Emmett may be 13 uh, or 14. Uh, but if he isn't, uh, he ought to know that not only was I discussing the war from 2014 onwards, so was everybody else. The BBC, CBC, CNN, The Times, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Manchester Guardian, all of them reported on the assault on the people of eastern Ukraine by Nazis. All of them did pieces on the swastikas and the Sieg Heiling and the jackbooting uh, of the civil war launched against the people of eastern Ukraine. They don't mention it now, but they all mentioned it at the time. Sorry, Lance, go on. Oh, no, I, but that wasn't my question. I'm just saying the news reporting certainly changed. I, I can only assume that sure. they decided they were going to originally share the mineral fines with the Russians, and they decided to have wanted to winner-take-all sort of attitude over that. Mm. But that wasn't my question. Mm. My question was, I've noticed, especially with YouTube, there's a lot of, it's it's got to be State Department funded, but there's these stations pretending to be Indian, or maybe they are, and they're really trying to turn Indian opinion against China. Now, oh, yeah? do actual regular Indian people care about China that much? Like, well, uh, there's obviously history. There's bad blood uh, in uh, the middle term history uh, between China and India. They fought several wars against each other over the line of control. Uh, in far-flung parts of China uh, and India um, claims sovereignty over those pieces of land. Um, but in the modern time, in the modern period, it's so obvious that China and India have so much to gain from having good relations with each other that they're now getting on like a house on fire. And that must drive uh, their uh, enemies uh, mad. The Americans had a lot of uh, money on keeping India in the anti-China, anti-Russia camp. But the, uh, through membership of what they called the Quad, if you'll remember. Uh, but that hasn't worked. Uh, Russia and India have historic relations since independence, since before independence. And uh, that has survived changes of government, changes of ideology uh, within the Indian Republic. Uh, and now China and India have excellent relations, are trading with each other like Bilio uh, and in their own currencies. And so it's an epic fail for Washington. So sure, they'll be putting money into trying to throw a spanner uh, in the works. Last word to you, Lance. No, well, I was just wondering if the, I, I just had assumed because they were pushing that agenda so hard that that probably, it was probably something like you just said. That's all. I just yeah. wanted to, it'll, I, it'll you be, know yeah, a little bit more be, about the world. You know, yeah, Lance, uh, at the, at, at the Old Witch in London, there's a building now in private use, but used to be called Bush House. It was the headquarters of the BBC World Service. Of all the languages and all the countries in the world that the BBC World Service could have dev devoted uh, their precious uh, um, bandwidth and budget to, the BBC World Service had radio stations in Bosnian, in Serbian, in Croatian, uh, and they, they dedicated thousands and thousands of hours of broadcasting every year to breaking up Yugoslavia. And it was all paid for by the British Foreign Office. As is still the case today, the BBC World Service still receives 
huge financial subvention from uh, the British government. And they complain when someone describes them as British state-affiliated uh, media. So it would be no surprise if somebody was paying for these television stations that you are describing. Tom Orr uh, sends an email. That's at onair at moats.tv. And he says, ask Tucker Carlson to sponsor moats. It's worth a punt. <laughs> Best wishes. Tom, uh, back to the lines. Glasgow, my old stamping ground, where Malcolm wants to talk about Tucker Carlson. Go ahead, Malcolm. I was just listening to the song Bye Bye Mr. American Pie there, George, and it was, uh, I think it's fairly apt. Um, my point very, is, very George, great, I... Very, very great song. Fantastic, and it's quite quite uh, pertinent right now. Um, my ears yeah. perked uh, last week when I heard either a senator or a congressman mention Rupert Murdoch by name, and I was thought... That means there's probably trouble in the camp there, because when you've got Fox News with their top, uh, uh, you know, person that gets the most audience and most Democrats listen to him, and he's the voice, he's a guy that listens to the gray zone, he, he listens to Jimmy Dore, he's anti-war, which is surprisingly uncommon these days, which is amaz amazes me. It breaks my heart to see all these young men dying in Eastern Europe. Um, and so for Rupert Murdoch to be named by a Congress person, a, a, a political leader in America, and then the next week for him to be fired. And I think, you know, I don't want to be conspiratorial, but, you know, is the media controlling the government or is the government controlling the media or do they work hand in hand, George? I'm confused. Well, they work hard in hand. They work hand in hand, but uh, in the end, uh, the government is controlling the media. If you look at the Twitter files, which, uh, because of my legal case against Twitter, I'm doing in very great detail, and my lawyers in even greater uh, detail, granular detail, uh, the Twitter files make uh, abundantly clear the gigantic state effort that went into. Uh, censoring and policing the boundaries of public debate in what was supposed to be uh, the public square. That's what we used to call it. Uh, the public square was being patrolled by and, if necessary, dissident voices carried off that public square and taken to black sites somewhere, metaphorically speaking, uh, banned from being able to talk in that public square. And these were all state-driven. But, of course, what you get is, uh, uh, as we would describe it in Glasgow, uh, you get crawlers uh, in, the, in the media who want to prove that they're more Catholic than the Pope, more royal than the king. And uh, they'll do the government's bidding even before the government asks them to do it. And the upper reaches of the old Twitter, the man bun, man bag, skinny jeans and sneakers era, uh, thankfully now gone, uh, this was filled with eager, earnest young men, or whatever their pronouns were, uh, who saw it as their duty to do what they thought was the will of the deep state, oftentimes without even having specifically been asked to uh, do so. Many thanks, uh, Malcolm, uh, for that call. Back to the Super Chats. Galloway Raider sends £9.99. Your opinion on the SNP, George, and the corruption they have followed for decades, stealing from the poor Scottish taxpayers, putting vulnerable people in a disgraceful situation. Well, I have uh, at length uh, expounded on that. Uh, to my astonishment, uh, on TikTok, one of my rants about the SNP has 150,000 views, and it only lasted a minute and a half. Uh, so you can easily uh, track back uh, on it. I spoke about it, I think, last week uh, in my monologue uh, on moats. Uh, so thanks uh, for that. Peter Moss, 
sends five pounds, sharp and to the point. Thank you, Peter. Basil Beshkov sends 10 US dollars. Zelensky got the OK from the USA to call China. Um, Basil, again, sends another $10. Give Biden a helmet and let him go to Ukraine. He couldn't find his way through the Rose Garden, never mind to Ukraine. DP King gives £10. Thank you. Lyle Gentleman, again, sends another two US dollars and says the US will collapse before things improve here. And Lyle, again, for a third time, sends $5 and says, Redacted said in a live stream, they want Tucker, if only. Well, he's welcome to a gig here on the midweek mother of all talk shows. He can't have the Sunday, that's mine. But if he'd like to present the midweek mother of all talk shows, he's welcome, but we'll not be able to pay him anything because we don't pay me anything. Ian Livingston sends £1.99. Do you think Tucker Carlson will run with Trump? That's an interesting possibility. Uh, that he might run for office, after all. What was Trump but a TV guy uh, when he ran for office? Why not Tucker? Uh, coming up after the break, it is one of our very top guests, Brian Berletic, who knows more than a thing or two about war and wars in China and in the Ukraine. Coming up after the break. Stay tuned. The 1897 edition of War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, read by George Galloway, available only on Patreon. The cylinder was artificial, hollow, with an end that screwed out. Something within the cylinder was unscrewing the top. Good heavens! said Ogilvy. There's a man in it, men in it, half roasted to death, trying to escape. At once, with a quick mental leap, he linked the thing with the flash on Mars. The thought of the confined creature was so dreadful to him that he forgot the heat and went forward to the cylinder to help turn. But luckily, the dull radiation arrested him before he could burn his hands on the still glowing metal. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Good heavens, said Ogilvy, there's a man in it. Somehow it reminded me of Joe Biden shuffling forward to tell us he was running for office. Now, get voting. What issue got Fox News' Tucker Carlson sacked? You can vote on all the platforms, including my telegram, t.me forward slash George Galloway. Brian Berletic, one of the most popular of our recent guests on Moats, is a former U.S. Marine He's a geopolitical analyst and founder of The New Atlas, which is a great title and a great publication because we are actually in an era in which a new atlas is being drawn. And Brian analyzes it better than almost anyone anywhere in the world. I'm very glad he's back on the show. Brian, thanks for uh, joining us. Um, let's talk first, if we can, about the significance of the Chinese initiative over the Ukraine war. Um, I presume, given the closeness of the relationship between China and Russia, that Russia has given its blessing uh, to this effort. I presume, given that Zelensky is a puppet of the United States, that uh, he was told by the US he would have to take the call does this mean that peace is about to break out, in your view? First of all, thank you so much for having me on. It's an honor and a pleasure. Uh, regarding the, the Chinese communication with Ukraine, uh, China has always strived to live up to its adherence to, the interna to international law, 
and to maintaining diplomacy. Uh, I, th I think everybody can see quite clearly that what the United States is doing to Russia through Ukraine is the same process the U.S. is doing to China through its, its own island province of Taiwan. Uh, so I, I think China wants to play a constructive role if possible. I, I don't think there's anyone anywhere who wants this conflict to, to last longer, at least not in Moscow, not in Beijing. Uh, so I think they would, they would like to keep that door open, the door open to diplomacy, even if it is entirely unlikely that Ukraine, uh, the regime in Kiev, will walk through it. You think it's entirely unlikely? Uh, because I'm wondering uh, that uh, Xi Jinping would not take this move, would not take this big step, appointing an envoy, dispatching him to Kiev and so on, if he didn't have some indication uh, that something good might come of it. I think that's a good point. Uh, I, I think ultimately things will be determined on the battlefield. But once that, that determination happens, this door has already been opened by Beijing and then the process can begin there. So they're laying the groundwork for something that can possibly happen. Uh, everyone is waiting for this Ukrainian spring offensive. Now it looks like possibly a, a summer or fall offensive. Uh, and if it goes wrong, I, I can't really see what, what, a, what other option Ukraine has but to uh, explore the possibilities of diplomacy. Well, let's you and I explore it. Uh, I uh, listed uh, what I, if I were running Russia, would be my bottom lines uh, earlier in the show. I don't know if you heard them, but the, uh, the obvious one that everyone would expect is that uh, Ukraine is a neutral country, that it does not join NATO, but neither does NATO infiltrate Ukraine. In other words, a NATO free zone. That would be, it would seem to me, an obvious top line. Uh, then the issue of the self-determination of the Russian-speaking people in the east and south of the country. It's inconceivable to me that Russia would hand these people back to the tender mercies of, uh, of the regime in Kiev. Uh, the, uh, the issue then uh, would boil down to, uh, to Crimea. Uh, there is no possibility, is there, that Russia will ever cede sovereignty of uh, Crimea. It was only ever a paper transaction, uh, a drunken night in the 1950s by Khrushchev, uh, who handed over Crimea from Russia to Ukraine when they were both members of the USSR. It's part of the strategic uh, patrimony of uh, the Russian state and will never be handed back. I absolutely agree. And even in 2013, before the U.S. overthrew the elected government of Ukraine and, and then thus taking Ukraine's sovereignty from it, the U.S. government funded a poll that found that uh, the majority of people in Crimea identify as either Russian or Crimean a very small minority identified as Ukrainian. And even at that time, before the, the violent coup that overthrew the elected government, almost 25% wanted to join the Russian Federation. And, and then obviously in 2014, they had many more reasons to want to join the Russian Federation. So there's, there's no doubt, and even US government funded polls uh, indicate that the people of Crimea want to be part of the Russian Federation. And it, it would be an injustice to them to hand them back over to Ukraine for, for what reason and to what end. Uh, and then the, the other regions, the Russian-speaking regions that Russia now controls, uh, to hand them back to Ukraine, I, I think it would be uh, very difficult to, to fathom. And uh, it all ultimately boils down to the fact that the U.S. has captured Ukraine and it is using it as a proxy against Russia. And this is unacceptable to Russia, its national security interests, its self-preservation. And that's ultimately what's going to drive whatever diplomacy unfolds. And unfortunately, as long as it is a proxy war 
that the U.S. is fighting at the expense of Ukrainian blood, not American blood, the U.S. has no incentive to stop this proxy war. And so that, that's why, I, unfortunately, I believe a lot of this is going to have to be settled on the battlefield first. But at least China is laying the groundwork for the, for the possible follow-on of diplomacy. And yet Zelensky took the call. Uh, he had earlier said that he would no longer take a call from China because it didn't come earlier. He took the call. Would he have cleared that with Washington, that he would take the call, that he would exchange envoys with Beijing? Uh, absolutely. Nothing happens in Ukraine unless uh, the U.S. gives the okay. And uh, ultimately, this is a U.S. client regime in power in Kiev. This is uh, essentially a U.S. proxy war being waged against Russia. It's not a war between Russia and Ukraine. And uh, I think China resisted uh, calling sooner because it would have just played into the hands of the U.S. and this narrative that they're trying to create that Russia is isolated uh, on the international stage, that everyone is talking with Kiev and it's, it's Russia standing alone. But, but also they do have an obligation to diplomacy and international law. So they're, they're playing a balancing game here. And they also are fully aware that they are next. After Russia, the U.S. is coming after China. Well, no one who saw uh, the crowd around Mr. Lavrov in the Security Council uh, at the UN this week could possibly imagine that Russia is in any way isolated. Mr. Lavrov is by far and away the most popular international diplomat in the whole world, possibly that there has ever been. Uh, his press conferences, his speech at the UN, was as fine a speech as I have ever seen delivered at the uh, UN. So their isolation of Russia is not going at all well. But let's, uh, let's switch to the Chinese track, because I'll argue that the attempts to isolate China are now not going well either. We had, of course, the famous now visit of little Macron uh, to China and the statements that he made there and since he came back. But lo and behold, uh, a man misnamed cleverly, uh, who is now the Foreign Secretary of Great Britain, made a statement today uh, which must have caused horror in Washington. He said that to, for Britain to declare a new Cold War with China uh, would be uh, against Britain's national interest and that Britain has no intention of doing so. Appearing to side with Macron uh, on the, this uh, set of issues rather than Washington. And of course, we had the uh, busy terminus uh, of uh, Beijing over the last few weeks with the president of Brazil there, with the prime minister of, uh, of Germany there, then the foreign minister of Germany there. All roads lead to Beijing. So it's the U.S. that is looking isolated over China, isn't it? It, it is the United States. And it's also anyone who is going to uh, side with them in this growing tension. Unfortunately, while it is very true that it is not in anyone's interest in Europe to side against China, it was never in Europe's interest to side against Russia. Look, look at what Germany, for example, has done to itself. And I, I thought it uh, implausible that they would do so much damage to themselves. And yet here we are, and this is what they've done. They've allowed uh, the Nord Stream pipelines to be destroyed. They haven't said a single word about it. And there's no sign that they're going to relent in supporting the U.S. proxy war against Russia and Ukraine. So uh, it's illogical for Europe to then move on to China and side with the United States in, in yet another conflict. Uh, and, and yet it was illogical for them to do this with Russia. So I, I hope that they're starting to come to their senses. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, their, their track record is to say these things, but uh, not really actually follow through with them. Now, uh, you'll have been following, as, as I am, uh, the BRICS, uh, the, the existing BRICS 
uh, are now bigger than the G7. Um, and there's a queue a mile long waiting to join the BRICS. Uh, we, we're going to run out of alphabet to describe the BRICS. Uh, there's, I think, 14 or more applicants uh, for membership uh, of the BRICS and others who want to be associate uh, members uh, of the BRICS. This is a profound rewriting of the atlas to, uh, to refer to your wonderful new atlas. Yeah, absolutely. This is the rise of multipolarism. And this is what is driving U.S. foreign policy at the moment, this attempt to put it back into the bottle, to reassert U.S.-led unipolar power over the planet. And, and it's manifesting itself in this proxy war in Ukraine against Russia, buildup of tension with China or the island province of Taiwan, and uh, conflicts and interference all along the periphery of both Russia and China. And so we're, we're watching the world pivot away from this old way of doing business, and which in many ways, these nations were, were unsatisfied with, with this arrangement. So in many ways, they were coerced into it. Now there's an alternative, and they're choosing it. And it, it seems like for, for the United States, the window of opportunity either is closing or has already closed. And we're watching what is foreign, US foreign policy. It really is seeming more like desperation. Now, lastly, uh, Africa is, of course, uh, uh, an increasingly important uh, part of uh, the world economic uh, map, uh, possibly the richest of all continents, a billion people, uh, increasingly uh, acting in, in, in concert uh, with each other, uh, shaking off the, the, the colonial chains, uh, in a way that hasn't been seen since independence. And lo and behold, now we've got another civil war popping up in the Sudan. What's going on there, Brian? It's very difficult to tell exactly what's going on in Sudan, but what we have watched for generations is the, the United States and Europe, uh, colonialism, whether it was old-fashioned colonialism or neocolonialism, using divide and conquer to keep all of the nations of Africa down. And this is what has allowed the West to basically loot the continents, again, for generations. And now we see China and Russia coming in. They have a different approach. They're investing in these countries. They are working with these people, not imposing themselves upon these people. And uh, we can see what's happening. Nations are rising up. They're becoming stronger, more unified, and less susceptible to U.S. and European interference. And so they will do anything possible to, again, reassert this paradigm, and they're doing this through divide and conquer. And they, and they do it by sparking conflicts. Uh, we have to be very careful when we look at these conflicts. We really have to follow the money, look carefully at the associations of the, the different leaders of the various factions uh, to really make sure we understand whose side uh, is, is who on, but uh, ultimately instability seems only to serve the West. It has served the West, it's their method of operation, and I believe that it still serves their interest to destabilize the, the investments and the stability that both Russia and China are trying to bring. Follow the money, follow the bio labs of all the places in the world where America could have put another bio lab one of them is in the Sudan. Brian Berletic, thank you as always for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. The poll is uh, doing well uh, and most people still regard Ukraine as the proximate reason for Tucker Carlson being sacked. You can still vote until more or less the end of the show. I'll be right back. 60 seconds. Count them. A big thanks to the people who support me on the Patreon page. I really have come to depend on the income from that. It costs a pound a week, not even the price of a cup of coffee in an insalubrious cafe. 
If you think you could stretch to that, please support me on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash George Galloway. Now, the Mortz team have added a tiered system on my Patreon page where you can become an official Moats graduate. How about that? I speak as someone who graduated from nowhere, uh, from the factory floor in Michelin. But you can become a Moats graduate and legend. Uh, you can give a regular donation to support the show and my work. You can now upgrade from a, a mere Patreon to a Moats graduate at £10 a month as opposed to five pounds a month i think it is uh, and you can receive official moats legend status for 20 pounds you are listening to the mother of all talk shows with george galloway I do hope you'll see your way to supporting me on Patreon. Uh, I'm not looking for Tucker Carlson levels of remuneration, but it would be good to get some remuneration at all. And that's where I get it from my Patreon page. So please, if you can, it's only the price of a cup of coffee in a very, very insalubrious cafe every week. Although there are tears, you can be a graduate, you can be a legend. And if you are a legend, you'll get priority on the phone calls. Andy uh, from Patreon says, you should be getting a fella like Tucker booked on to Moats ASAP. Well, there's a gagging order on him, apparently. Uh, if he's going to get paid up the rest of his contract, he's got to uh, get agreement uh, on where he can give interviews and make statements on. A.A. Uh, a. Martin says, RFK Jr. sums it all up and includes the other two. And Paul MacDonald says Tucker was going to have RFK Jr. and Trump on his broadcast and the four horsemen of the apocalypse, Blinken, Sullivan, Biden and Newland, definitely don't want the American people hearing the truth. That's the power of the deep state. Keep fighting for us. You're a beacon of hope. God bless you and your beautiful family. Thank you, Paul, very much for that. And Darren Alevi, a good friend of the show, says, I think maybe all three in small parts, that is COVID, RFK, and Ukraine. Uh, but I think the majority of it is because of his view on the Ukraine war. It's at odds with the hawkish culture at Fox News. And in large part, the old man Murdoch wants to squash any dissent on the right to the neocons' next pet project, Ron DeSantis. It's reported that a big cheer went up around the Pentagon when the news of Tucker Carlson's sacking broke out. Imagine, the Pentagon were cheering, the CIA were cheering, the murderers of JFK were cheering, and all the liberals were cheering too. It's a funny old world, as Mrs. Thatcher once said. Edgar Abd says definitely RFK Jr. is what scares the deep state most. And Scott Thompson says, whatever you think of Tucker Carlson, he was the one mainstream news commentator who could sympathetically interview both Donald Trump and RFK Jr. And the neocons cannot allow that. Uh, so please do support me uh, on Patreon. Uh, now, Lucy is in Virginia on Tucker Carlson. Lucy, welcome to the show. Thank you, George. I want to give a shout out to Norma, your friend. I think she's in Bristol. Norma, the Norma. legend in Bristol. Thank you. Yes. She is. She has encouraged me. Her. She's fearless. She calls you, and her bravery has encouraged me. And I want to say that the last. I think two of the last comments you just read are exactly right. Although we can't give too much credit to the four horsemen because they're imbeciles. And I think the deep state <laughs> knows actually. that. They know that. The four, do the four donkey men. Yeah, that's, that's about the size of it. Unfortunately, um, <laughs> what I think is going on over here, and this bears on what happened to Tucker Carlson, is what we have is a uniparty. It doesn't matter who we vote for. It doesn't matter what we want. It doesn't matter what we do, what we tell them, what we... what. Whatever side of the aisle you're on, 
when they get it, the, the reins of power, they do not do it. They do not You're do right. the thing that... You're right, and that, that Uniparty exists in Britain also. Uh, it is uh, two cheeks of the same backside. Uh, you're going to get the same policies, uh, whoever, whichever party gets in. So why I, I think this bears on, on Tucker, and, and this sort of uh, brings in what Malcolm in Glasgow was saying earlier, is that um, it, it, Nico got pressured out of his, his, his YouTube um, presence was obliterated by YouTube, you know, owner of which is Google, um, out of he was censored out of existence for opposite reasons that Matt Walsh in this country, a conservative um, YouTuber with a huge, huge following, uh, is being uh, is, they're trying to censor him out of existence on YouTube. So what I think is going on is whoever is running this show. It really doesn't matter. The government's not in charge. It's the money that's in charge. And the money doesn't have any boundaries or loyalty to country or, or care what goes on with the citizens of any given country. It's all about the money. And, and, and so, you know, those are the people in charge. The, in, in terms of uh, Google taking their marching orders, you can say that they're taking their marching orders from people calling from Washington, but who are they getting their marching orders from in Washington? That's who's in charge. It's the so beautiful whatever, call, so. very powerful, uh, Lucy. Very, very powerful indeed. I'm grateful to you uh, for it. Uh, let's go to Liverpool and hear from Michael again on Tucker. Go ahead, Michael. Hi, GJ. Uh, I'm just calling to say that I think the straw that broke the camel's back for Tucker was mentioning the indictment following the raiding of the homes by the... The indictment of who? Of these black socialists? Oh, can you still hear me? Is that any better? I can. I can. Go ahead. You can. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, so, they, this has happened before, but there was a murder involved this time. They're, they're not really charging them with anything that, that could possibly stick, uh, but they've still been indicted. And Tucker was the only person to mention it. It wasn't the first person to mention it. And uh, that was actually our comrade, Caleb Moken, uh, from the CPI. And. Um, Obviously, I'll say. And I'd also like to say about obviously Robin drooling over the um, Lavrov speech at the UN. Um, and it was a fantastic speech. But the thing is, whatever the Western press, whatever he, whatever course of action they take, the Western press is going to scream red murder. And this should have been, you know, really dealt with harshly six months ago when Azov stopped. And I did send a super chat to that, but it didn't get read out, I think, because it was quite me. But, um, well, I'm grateful I'm there. grateful to you, Michael, and you've now made the point. It, it has uh, come to something. When Tucker Carlson, a man of the right, at the Heritage Foundation of all places, denounced the indictment of these black socialists that have been arrested in the United States, and charged with being Russian agents because of their speech, because of what they said in the land of the free where the First Amendment guarantees freedom of speech. Tucker Carlson was the man who most powerfully denounced that. Whilst the so-called squad progressives, some of them themselves people of color, couldn't say a dicky bird about it. Doesn't that sum up the extent to which the old terms of left and right are OTOs? That what matters is what's right and what's wrong. Not whether someone has in the past or even now in the present describes themselves as left. If they're wrong, they're wrong. 
whatever party or faction they are or claim to be a member of. Here's the numbers. If you're in the US or Canada, it's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. If you're in the UK or Ireland, it's oh eight oh eight one nine six double five double two. And if you're in the rest of the world, call zero zero four four two zero three nine double six two six two five. Now uh, some more super chats. Lyle gentlemen for the fourth time sends ten US dollars. Hey George, do you know any good resources to learn about countries like the USSR and Yugoslavia without a Western narrative spun on it? Yes, tons of them. Uh, drop me an email, Lyle. Peter Dowdell sends two pounds. Vladimir Lukic sends 20 euros. Thanks, both of you. Mose H sends five pounds. And 021 Johnny One sends 20 euros. Ronwell Nagales sends 10 US dollars. I won an auctioned item that's autographed WandaVision Funko Pop by this child star who I'm a huge fan of for an online charity auction against cancer. Please congratulate me on this show. Congratulations, if it's made you happy. Uh, James Warren Bay sends two US dollars and Manuel Jesus Arquila Ramirez sends US 9.99. Tucker also defended the black socialists. Whatever happened to that Juan Guaido, by the way? The one all these Western governments told us was the president of Venezuela. The one that the British government spent taxpayers' money assisting in the court case to get Venezuela's sovereign gold given to him instead of to Venezuela. Whatever happened to that guy? Are these Western governments and the EU hoping that we'll just forget about it, this embarrassing fiasco, when they plucked a guy off the street and told us he was now the president of Venezuela? Do you know where he is now? Where else would he be? He's doing a master's degree in Miami, Florida. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Rob is in Toronto. Wants to talk about U.S. Treasuries, out of which China is retreating at quite a rate. Go ahead, Rob. Good evening, George. That's exactly what I'd like to talk about. Uh, I have a minor conspiracy theory for you, and I'd like to draw your attention uh, to something that I find a bit odd. Go on, yeah. Well, the U.S. Treasury Department uh, provides a report called the, it's called the Major Foreign Holders of Treasury Securities Report. I encourage everybody to check it out. If you Google Major Foreign Holders of Treasury Securities, it's one of the top results. You can't miss it. Uh, this report is very telling, I think. It's basically a current account report of all countries' holdings of U.S. Treasuries month over month. And what you'll see is, to your point, is that China's holdings have been dropping pretty systematically over the last year, as well as Japan's. Now, that's not yeah. the thing. Here's what I've noticed. The report is published on the 15th day of every month. So the latest report we have on the February figures was supposed to be due on April 15th. Yet here we are, April 26th, and the report still hasn't been published for the February figures. Now, George, you worked in government a long time. You know how the bureaucratic machine works. You know that these reports are more or less set in stone when it comes to scheduling. If they're coming out on the 15th, then that's it. That's the day they come out. I've been following this report for over a year now, and it's published on the 15th day of the month like clockwork. Now my theory, George, is that the February numbers have dropped so significantly, particularly China, maybe Saudi Arabia, India, countries like that, they've dropped so significantly in February that the Treasury officials were probably shocked. And they're probably, you know, currently doing their due diligence, figuring out how to set the narrative and, and so on and so forth. Um, 
that's my theory. My question is, have I completely... Well, it's, a, 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 it's an entirely plausible theory and it is indeed strange uh, that the, the 15th uh, date was, was missed and missed now by 11 days. Uh, it is, of course, I've been watching China withdraw uh, systematically from its holding of U.S. Treasury bills. Uh, they can't sell them all at the same time. They can't withdraw in one big uh, leap because the price will crash and they'll be the losers. Uh, so they are uh, increasingly withdrawing month by month by month. Because why would anyone in their right mind put their sovereign gold in the Bank of England or uh, invest their country's money in U.S. treasuries when the chances of America defaulting are so high, as Yellen pointed out just in the last few days, how catastrophic it would be for America to have to default on its debts. But these things are now in the conversation. So if they're in the conversation, would you... Would you lend money to a man who was openly talking about the fact he might be going to be bankrupt? Kevin in Suffolk on Tucker Carlson. Go ahead, Kev. Hi, George. Um, yeah, so Hi. I think uh, I think the Tucker issue is uh, to do with RFK. I think um, I think they they are desperate to sort of prevent RFK getting the kind of coverage that Tucker would have given him um, and mm. basically sort of laid the groundwork for a, um, a third party run, which I think he's, well, I hope sincerely is going to do. Um, and I, I think, hope so I mean, too. I, wanted... uh, I think it's a forlorn hope now that there are going to be no debates that the DNC has endorsed that Sanders has endorsed what kind of is the point of seeking the Democratic Party's nomination? Well, the only point is to generate publicity, build a base, get the fundraising going in order to run as a third party candidate. That's how I see it, don't you? Absolutely. I mean, and Tucker would have been, um, you know, Tucker would have been oxygen to him. I mean, you know, um, Tucker's, uh, as you said, Tucker's audience was growing. And, I mean, I, I also wanted to say, I mean, I, I said to your call screener, you know, I mean, I probably politically identify more with, with Tucker than I have done with you over the years, George, much, you know, like, uh, you know, you get a lot of callers from, from guys who've, like, um, you know, didn't see eye to eye with you <laughs> years ago and, like, sure. now sure. really admire you. And I, I'm in that, you know, I mean... It, okay. Uh, somebody said, uh, I can't remember, there, there was a, a you know, working class guy called in, I think when you were in China, and said about the, uh, the Senate hearings. And, you yeah. know, I mean, you're, you're a, an amazing guy. You're a force of nature. I, I really, I can't, I've, like, I've thought about a lot of what you say. A lot of what you said years ago has been proved to be right, and I was wrong. There's some things you say now I can't get my head around, but we are all on a journey, and like Tucker... Um, has been on a, an amazing journey. I mean, he, he was, years ago, he was like uh, um, like that Bill Crystal guy, you know. You know, he was, you know, yeah. Comp- yeah. Yeah, I mean, preppy, like, uh, obnoxious, old-school Republican that, that, you know, nobody would have supported. But there's, there's part of the Republican Party that, and, and even a few Tory MPs, um, I quite like uh, Andrew, Andrew Bridgen, you know, who are like, Asking ex Tory oh, MP, he's just been expelled. Oh, he hasn't, has he? Oh, my God. Yeah, today he was expelled from the Conservative Party. That is just... I, I just... I mean, I just cannot believe what's going on. I cannot believe what is going on. Anybody who, like... Well, you're absolutely you know, right, Kevin, uh, that there's a lot of journeys going on. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of redefinition. Uh, of what it means to be this or to be that. For me, and I'm grateful for your kind words, uh, for me it is about, is this thing right or is it wrong? There are things that are just wrong, whether you call them left or whether you call them right. 
It is just wrong to attempt, God forbid, to take my small primary school children uh, to uh, a drag show burlesque with, uh, with all kinds of bumping and grinding and men in women's lingerie. That is wrong. Now, if that makes me right-wing, I'm right-wing. There are other things that I think are wrong, uh, that we are uh, slipping more and more quickly into, like the euthanasia society, where inconvenient uh, people uh, with, uh, who meet a sufficient level uh, of uh, illness, of chronic sickness, and, uh, and a level of uh, family um, readiness to, uh, to countenance uh, their being dispatched, uh, we're on the way to that society. In the Netherlands, where my wife comes from, you can now dispatch a 15-year-old child who is uh, quote-unquote terminally ill in euthanasia. Now, does that make me right-wing or left-wing? Uh, for me, it's a moral question of right and wrong. Last word to you, Kevin. Well, I, I totally agree. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a moral issue. And I, you know, like you, George, I've got, uh, I'm a Christian, I've got religious faith, and I think it's, you know, it's principalities and powers. You know, I think there's something, there is something very, very strange going on, and whether it's all down to, uh, uh, you know, Klaus Schwab and that kind of thing, who knows? I mean, I, I just think you've got to be, you've got to, like, You've got to view it as a moral issue and and make your decisions carefully as to which side you're on. Yeah, um, I, I think yeah. I think I think that that's uh, that that is right. The devil is present in the world, uh, Kevin. The devil's greatest achievement is to persuade most people that he doesn't exist. Let's go back to the super chats. Uh, G G S H Eck sends nine pounds ninety nine. Much obliged to you. Shlomo R sends ten dollars. Thanks, Shlomo. J sends two pounds. George's favorite historical event has to be Spartacus and the great slave uprising in Rome, which very nearly succeeded. Uh, Dave Sconyer sends twenty U.S. dollars. Love what you're doing. The world needs all the truth it can hear. I'm beyond embarrassed by the actions of our joke of a president. I'm sad to say America's best days are definitely in the rear view mirror. Thank you, Dave. Summer of 1970. Oh, what a great name. What a summer that was. Ah, I was 16 that summer. Boy, that was a summer. Uh, sends five US dollars. I've set my own rules to live by. The first one is never believe anything the government says. That's a quote from George Carlin. Thank you so much. C-R-D-M-A-U, Krdmao, sends five euros, much obliged to you. Michael Horstman, $2.99. Kyle Wool, sends five US dollars. Bigfoot, sends five pounds. Liberals and anarchists in the US think the US is bad because it's socialist. Therefore, China is to blame. You can't make this up. Love you, George. You are the best. Thank you, Bigfoot. Gus Creek, a good friend of the show from the Netherlands, sends six euros. George, my seatbelt is well and truly buckled at the start of every show. It's never a smooth ride, but I enjoy every show from beginning to end. Thank you so very much, Gus. Quick break, and then it's your show right to the end. As I say, how lucky we are to have the audience that we do. A million people every week watching all or part of the mother of all talk shows and most attentive to what they hear and many of them truly brilliant students. It's quite humbling, actually. Oh, George, uh, blessings upon your cranium. It's, yes, it's the metamorphosis, man, or me the more for this, the intimations of immortality experiences. <laughs> George, 
<laughs> you, you, I like what you said. I, I love a lot of things you're saying. You know, your, your daily communion it, it, with God is through your conscience. I, I wanted to comment on that. That's beautifully said. Your Socratic method on the on-air university is very beneficial, and I can only speak personally. Um, I uh, have appreciate it because I had called last time in regard to the general strike and you helped to really refine my understanding of that from a different point. The alternative point of view. When I heard that last week and again today, I had this kind of visceral gut reaction to it. And I know what you're, what you mean by that. And, you know, the Moats audience knows what they mean by that because we're all informed citizens. We wouldn't be here if we weren't. For the, the masses who don't necessarily follow uh, geopolitics, let's say, they're going to listen to whatever the mainstream media tells them. And for them, anything that's alternative, the automatic kind of reaction is, oh, okay, it's a crackpot view, it's a conspiracy theory, it's an extreme view, when really it's not. It's, let's call it what it is, it's fact-based commentary. Hello, George, nice to talk to you. By the way, you deserve every penny you get, because you're the only person who speaks the truth over all the fake news. I wanted to personally thank you for um, bringing such great guests that speak about the situation. Also, I have become uh, more aware of, of people like Bla Max Blumenthal um, at the Gray Zone and others who, who do update us with the correct information about Syria. And um, this has just uh, been such a great eye-opener. So thank you. You are the people who have stuck with this show and transformed it into a truly global university where it can be said that every month at least four million people will watch this show. They're in Greece, they're in Canada, they're in America, they're in England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, they're in New Zealand, they're in Australia, they're in Norway, Denmark, Sweden, they're in Finland. They're all over the world. They're in Africa with a call from Nigeria. This is a truly global phenomenon and that is down to you. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Tell them that once there was a fleeting wisp of glory called Camelot. May God preserve the life of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And may God bless his efforts to try and change American politics for the better for the sake of the Americans, but for the sake of all of us. Here's a call from the United States, from Shlomo in Virginia, on Tucker Carlson. Go ahead, Shlomo. Shlomo, you there? Well, he's, oh, sorry, sorry. He's not... Do you hear me now? Hello? Yes, Shlomo, go ahead. You're on the air. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, yes, first, thanks very, very much for all your shows. Um, great. Um, about Tucker Carlson, he, um, we, we shouldn't forget that he poisoned quite a bit, the water. He is for a war with China, very strong on it. And he's a dangerous man. Uh, yes, and, and you're right, absolutely. What is right is right. What is wrong is wrong. And when he's right, absolutely. But we should also remember what is wrong about him. Thanks. Yeah, no, it's a very good point. I, I, I actually disagree with him on a very large number of things. China preeminently, uh, but also many of the attitudes that he has struck in the past on, on race, on social justice issues, as Nico House put it uh, earlier, uh, on his uh, support for uh, fiscally... Uh, conservative uh, policies uh, towards the poor, uh, towards the role of the state and the economy and so on. Many, many things. Uh, but what's right is right, as you say, and what's wrong is wrong. And 
he's, he's more than a stop clock. He's, he's right more than twice a day. He's been right now consistently on some of the biggest issues uh, in front of the country and the world. And sing hallelujah for that, Shlomo. I do. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for your call. Uh, Tommy, the legend, is in Glasgow. On Tucker Carlson. He's much listened to in, uh, in the barras, Tommy, I'm sure. Have, have they ever heard of Tucker Carlson and the Gorbals? Salam alaikum, George. How you doing? Waalaikum salam. Good, thanks. Go yes, ahead. he's much he's much heard of and changed days and, and sad days also. Uh, for myself, I just wanted to pay respect to my wee Auntie Rose who passed away on Friday, if I may, George. And I was coming May to God see you on the, the Monday when you were in Glasgow. Indeed. I was coming to see you on the Monday and I got the call that she was in hospital. She fought like a true Irish woman that she is for the whole of the blessed month of Ramadan just to slip a mortal coil on Friday. And for me, you're told uh, in Islam to give much thought to the destroyer of pleasure. Once before, George, many times before, I remember you saying, if you sit by an old Chinese proverb, if you sit by the side of the river, all your enemies will come washing by. And many of them have done in recent times for you, for your good self, George. If you look at all the people who have stood against you and spoken against you, mm. many great people now, many good people are now coming to your side and your aid because of your fearlessness, of your of your joie de vivre and uh, everything that you say against the powers that be, the satanic forces that are in the world just now, you've got to stand against them in whatever way you can. Now, Tucker Carlson, he's never been my bag of, of washing uh, for, a, for a good while until recently. And, and, and mm -hmm. you've got to jump on and aid people in, when they speak the truth when they identify evilness. It doesn't matter what background they've came from, what they've said before. They don't have... They, 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 if people... I mean, we live in terrible times because of the people that are running society to the, to the ground. And only good people are yourself and Tucker and people who are not afraid to, to say what has to be said. And that all put to your elbow for it, George. And, and you, you've been an inspiration, I mean... not for me, but many, many people. I mean, Tommy, what a beautiful, beautiful call and beautifully expressed, I must say, that uh, Tucker Carlson has uh, now put his neck on the line for the right things. He may still be wrong on many other things, but he has stood up now on the questions that are there around the COVID issue around the issue of the vaccines, around the issue of compulsion in medicine, the dismissal of people who have refused to uh, participate in, in, in taking an injection in which they did not believe, removing people's medical, personal autonomy, his stand against the Ukraine war, which I happen to believe is the uh, main reason why he's been removed, has been a virtuoso stand. He has eloquently, powerfully named names of those that are in this for the money. People say follow the money. He's done it on prime time. He's followed the money and told the people where the money is going. Who got rich out of this war? And the platform that he's given to great people like Jimmy Dore, don't forget, Jimmy's interview on Tucker Carlson recently was outstanding. Max Blumenthal, outstanding. His stand for the black socialists now under indictment didn't even happen at the height of the McCarthyite period. Indicting black people for supporting Russia, which is their First Amendment right. Who stood up for them? Tucker Carlson stood up for them. Not AOC or the squad 
or Rachel Maddow or even some of the so-called socialists in the United States. No, it was Tucker Carlson. So you put it beautifully, Tom, that it doesn't matter what they've said in the past, where they've been before, where they might still be now. Well, the right, the right. And we're the right, we have to support them. And that's why we have to support Tucker Carlson. But this is 2023, it's not 2003. You can't silence a man like Tucker. He will have platforms big, bigger than the platform he's now been expelled from. Might even make more money. <laughs> That would be a thing. But he will not be silenced. I don't believe. Because if he was only in it for the money, he wouldn't have been taking the stances that he's been taking. Those stances have cost him his job, his livelihood. He's now out of work, off a platform. Now he has to find another one. And I believe that in 2023, with the technological advances that have been made and the gains that we have made in democratic terms of being able to get our words out to people. I was just explaining to my brother-in-law before the show, sure there's a lot of sheep, sure the majority of people are sheep, sure the sheepdogs can herd them up even for the final journey to the slaughterhouse, to the abattoir, yes. But there are more people who know in the world today than there have ever been in the whole history of humanity. And the purpose of this show is to try and link up all the English-speaking ones so that at least we make a community, we make a base for better understanding and we can go out and evangelize, make dawah, Tommy. We can go and find converts. We can go and find people based on the knowledge that we have accumulated here together on this open university of the airwaves. And that is working. If you look at the numbers, of viewers of this show, all are in part. They are on a trajectory, now well over a million, now getting to one and a quarter million every week. New callers, new donors, new people sending emails, new people coming up to me in the street saying they never miss a show. These are important signs. They are important signs that the satanic powers and presences in the world are not getting it their own way. That good people are fighting back and linking up with other good people who they may not have considered to be good people uh, before. Frank just said, Tommy's call, the best of the night. From Frank in Largs in Scotland. I tend to agree, though there have been many good calls. But there's a legend on the line who cannot be denied. It's the legend. That's Norma in Bristol. Last call. Go ahead, Norma. Hello, George. Um, I want to thank Lucy from Virginia. Because, say hi, because um, I was quite flattered that she mentioned me earlier. Apart from that, George, I wanted to talk to you about the Eurovision Song Contest. Now, there's been so much uh -huh. publicity. You know, Charles and Camilla were on the Liverpool stage today promoting the competition. And, I mean, it makes me feel as if that if we don't follow this trend of Ukraine and us putting it on, we're almost traitors to the country. And um, I really not... I don't even really like it, but I, everybody's got their own people do. But it's so skewed against Ukraine and our country that it won't be a fair competition anyway. Do you know what I mean? No, they'll win it. They'll win it. Uh, they're, they're, 
I hope the they do. Some in, the Scotland, some in the Scotland camp tried to throw the European Football Championship tie against the <laughs> Ukraine so that they could uh, get through. Uh, or was it the World Cup? I forget. But I, I remember Graham Souness fulminating on the uh, on the sidelines saying that uh, Scotland should should let Ukraine win. Uh, thankfully, oh, they didn't. On. But they're definitely going to win the Eurovision Song Contest, aren't they? Well, it's a competition, and if it's a competition, it should not be skewed like that. And in any case, exactly. I just feel... How is it I chosen, feel, Norma? I, Do people phone in and vote, or what? Oh, blimey, George, when they vote, that's the most exciting thing, because I don't really like the songs, but that's my preference. They have all the countries, and they all have about 10 votes, and it takes about 40 minutes to get the results out. And most countries don't vote for the songs, they vote for the countries they like. Yeah, that's how we always get no point. <laughs> and we didn't do too bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, George. Well, I, I have never watched the Eurovision Song Contest, and I have never liked any of the winners, except uh, the, the Danish or the Swedish ABBA. Uh, they turned out to be a half-decent turn. I've got to say that because my missus likes them. But uh, I wish uh, that the best band wins. And that band is almost certain to be the Ukraine, however good or however bad they are. It's just politics. And it is uh, politics, uh, bread and circuses for the masses. But I'll tell you what, Norma, you don't see many Ukrainian flags around now. I mean, apart from on public buildings, you don't see many people sporting the Ukrainian colours anymore. More and more people have seen through it all. They know what the cost has been to them, and they see much more clearly than they did a year ago the truth of the matter. And they don't believe the liars that are lying to them. They don't believe them on anything else, so why should they unquestioningly believe them on this. I've overshot my time. Please forgive me, Norma. Thank you uh, for being our legendary last call. Uh, I'll be back, God willing, uh, on Sunday at the earlier time of 7 p.m. UK time. Please join me. Please bring another viewer with you. It's been marvelous for me. I hope it was for you. I wanted to read that little quote from Camelot because I watched a documentary on Netflix the other night about the great Richard Burton and I saw him recite it. Richard Burton, what a man, what an actor. Thanks for watching.